Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. The main purpose of Global Connections is to focus attention on international issues that impact people from Frankfurt, Kentucky to Frankfurt, Germany and from Lima, Ohio to Lima, Peru. Also, we try to take a look at the United Nations to look at the logical role of the UN in helping to deal with many, if not all, of these international issues. My guest today is someone who's been very involved when she worked for the United Nations and is still very involved in one of the most important issues, and that is of human rights. Mary Robinson served as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002 and as President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. Currently, Ms. Robinson is President of Realizing Rights, which is an ethical globalization initiative and is Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders. Might also mention that Ms. Robinson was the first female president of Ireland. Mary Robinson, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being with me, Madam President. Why don't we start off with a very basic question. Human rights, this is something we hear a lot about, we read about. Everybody probably has a different idea of exactly what human rights means, but we'll get to that in just a moment. But when you work for the United Nations as the High Commissioner for Human Rights, what was your main responsibility? What did you do? When I went there in September 1997, it was a relatively young office. It was created by the United Nations after a world conference in 1993. I was the second High Commissioner. The first one had left rather abruptly to go back and be Foreign Minister of his country. And I think he could see there were quite a lot of tasks to be done in uh, building up an office that could give that leadership in human rights. Uh, starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then the treaties that governments had voluntarily signed but were not really fully implementing and how to link with civil society, talk to the ministers of the government and say you must do more, uh, uh, advocate for new instruments to help to address gender-based violence and all the issues of human rights. Exactly. Now back in the well, really early to mid-1940s when President Franklin Roosevelt was very involved in creating the United Nations or being a key leader, a main architect of the UN, he was very involved, but also his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was very involved in helping to develop the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, which is really the foundation, I guess, of all of the human rights activities that have taken place over the years. And we have a, an interesting clip from Mrs. Roosevelt launching the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Good. <laughs> We stand today at the threshold of a great event, both in the life of the United Nations and in the life of mankind. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the international Magna Carta of all men everywhere. We hope its proclamation by the General Assembly will be an event comparable to the proclamation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man by the French people in 1789, the adoption of the Bill of Rights by the people of the United States, and the adoption of comparable declarations at different times in other countries. This, I think, lays out very nicely what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, and of course, December 10th, 2008, is the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, a major event. I, I wonder uh, if you could, if you could focus on the Universal Declaration for Human Rights as you see it. We heard what Ms. Roosevelt said, but how do you define the Universal Declaration for Human Rights? And is it a Bill of Rights or a Constitution for all 192 countries in the UN? Or some countries have their own Constitution and Bill of Rights, such as the United States, but how, how do you view that? Well, first of all, I hugely admire Eleanor Roosevelt and the role she played. And another important thing she said was that if human rights are to matter at all, they must matter in small places close to home, so small that you can't find them on any maps of the world. And that's the task. Uh, yes, we have the treaties, including, importantly, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the implementation, the relevance at local level where rights get violated is the important thing. And what the Universal Declaration constituted was a Magna Carta, as she said. It was the first universal declaration that, as it says in Article 1, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And putting dignity before rights was very important. It's that sense of identity. Sometimes 
there's been a tendency to characterize these as Western rights somehow, and you know that they're being imposed on other cultures. That's not the case. They were universal from the beginning. They looked at all the great religions of the world and also the humanist tradition. Um, the people who drafted under Eleanor Roosevelt came from China and the Lebanon and Chile and France and Canada. She wasn't herself a lawyer, but she was bossy, and she told them to write it <laughs> in simple language. There are 30 articles. Uh, I've lived um, a passion about the Universal Declaration because when I started as High Commissioner, we were just starting the 50th anniversary in 1998. And I even got the Guinness Book of Records for the work that we did during that year to have the Universal Declaration translated into more than 250 languages. Now it's well over 300 languages. When I went to China, I took a copy of the Universal Declaration in the Tibetan language into a school in Lhasa and handed it out to teachers. So it is universal, it is accepted by every country, but you asked me an important question. Is it a kind of binding Bill of Rights? That actually came later. The Universal Declaration was implemented by two main covenants, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And the majority of countries in the world have accepted those two covenants, and together we call them the International Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. Which are very, very important. And of course, that, that was one of the three major tenets of the creation of the United Nations, along with eliminating the scourge of war, secondly, promoting economic and social development around the world, and of course, the enhancement of human rights. Now, human rights, I mentioned earlier, that probably everyone watching this program has a, a, a little bit of a same, perhaps the same, but a little bit of a different idea of what human rights may be. What, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I realize there are many parts, but uh, what are some of the basic human rights that people have? You're very right that there is confusion and people have different images. The Universal Declaration actually sets out two different streams of rights, if I can put it that way. It uh, guarantees, of course, the right to life, no torture, everybody has an identity. You have the right to leave a country, though not necessarily the right to enter another country. Uh, freedom of expression, freedom of religion. Uh, right to education, a uh, very important right. And right to health, right to a standard of living which includes health and we call that the highest attainable standard of health. And there's a lot of writing about that now, and we're very involved with it. And what I feel very strongly is if you go to some of the poor countries, especially countries in Africa where we spend a lot of time in our work, and you ask a woman in a village, what do human rights mean to you? She'd probably say something like access to water and freedom from violence. And so that's the perspective of many, many people. If they can have access to water and food and can have education and health, and at the same time, freedom from violence and lack of corruption in government. That's what they mean by human rights, and that's not a bad definition. Not bad at all. It's a very good definition. Human rights has changed, though. Obviously, when we came out of World War II, President Roosevelt, well, he didn't live to see the creation of the United Nations, but Eleanor Roosevelt, when she was looking, she probably thought of the 65 million people who died in World War II, the hundreds of millions more who were dispossessed. They were thinking of one thing at that time, but the evolution of this concept of human rights has changed a bit. Has it not? Has it not become more refined? Uh, has it not become more expanded and more inclusive? It has, though I must say that the Universal Declaration itself, now 60 years old, um, is a living document that did foresee that kind of development. If you read the text of it, it's actually not completely gender sensitive. I mean, I hold that against Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, but still, that was, that was then. She was doing her best. Um, it did guarantee no discrimination on the basis of sex, but it keeps talking in the male language only, not male and female. But uh, what I think is very important is the way now, for example, in a very important document called In Larger Freedom, the then Secretary General Kofi Annan linked security, development, and human rights. And he said there would be no security, basically, without development. There would be no development without security. And there would be neither security nor development without human rights. And the new Human Rights Council was intended to be a more elevated body than its previous Commission on Human Rights to emphasize that importance. It is evolving. For example, at the moment, I'm talking a lot with others about the impact of climate change on human rights. And we're talking about the need for an alliance of climate justice based on implementing those human rights principles and the link between um, human rights and development, human rights and democracy.